Ralph Ellison, author of Invisible Man, participated in Focus at Iowa State. This is the annual Spring Festival of Arts. And Mr. Ellison, you have, of course, been known within the field of uh, literature for a few years. You have gotten some uh, important awards, which I could uh, verbalize. But let me ask you this, which one of the various awards, perhaps, has been most satisfying for you as a writer? Well, because it came uh, so early, uh, I guess the National Book Award, it was quite a shock to uh, find this uh, being given you. And, and um, it, it made me feel that, that uh, all of the time, some, uh, period of seven years over which I was writing the book uh, was, was well spent. And, and, and something else, too, that there was a, a generosity of, uh, of uh, attitude on the part of people in publishing who give the awards, and that they uh, uh, were not uh, uh, going to uh, put me in a... Uh, in a second-class position because of my race, but they were interested in my ability to write. It, it, this was a very, very important thing to discover when I was, when I just published my first book. Now, did this make, um, in a sense, um, a major difference as far as uh, your real dedication to continue your writing? Would you have considered not writing without some of these encouragements? Oh no! Uh, uh, the right, you don't write for prizes. Mm -hmm. You 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 write because this is the way you are most alive, the way you you feel that you can be most effective in confronting life and society and yourself even. So uh, they are, they are the cream <laughs> that comes. So, but you you you. I'm not knocking it. I'm very proud of it. Indeed, you know, today the National Book Award is a, uh, is a uh, cash sum of $1,000. Uh, in my day, it was a gold medal, and I'm very proud of the, the medal because once in a while now I can make $1,000, but I can't pick up another one of those <laughs> well, the medallions. Critics, the critics were kind to you, in a sense, from the very first, weren't they? Well, they, they were kind. Some uh, 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 were not. So one. Uh, very uh, widely syndicated uh, literary columnist uh, uh, described my book as a literary race riot. <laughs> 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 uh, there were a few others who were short-sighted and and uh, uh, and their descriptions of the book. But what can you do? You, I don't fault them. But they didn't quite understand what was going on. Uh, sometimes it. it the fact that uh, of my racial identity was more important than, than uh, what I was writing about or how, uh, how I managed to write it. But generally, the, 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 the reviews were perceptive. And incidentally, some of the most perceptive reviews that I received were written by women. And they were uh, women writing for, for papers in the South. And they, they were white. How do you account for this? <laughs> Well, uh, I don't account for it, except uh, uh, there's no, uh, 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 no way of deciding where intelligence is going to show up in the <laughs> United States. And uh, we do know that we have been teaching uh, literature in our colleges and writing and courses in criticism. And so the people go wherever they came from, or uh, they go wherever they can get jobs. And so you must always be alert and always be at your best because you don't know who is giving you the eye. <laughs> now, do you uh, do any work as far as a critic at all? Well, my book of, of, uh, of uh, essays, Shadow and Act, is a book of criticism for the most part. Uh, they are uh, uh, mainly cultural criticism concerned with uh, various books, jazz, various uh, uh, intellectual problems. I don't call myself a critic, but uh, I do uh, uh, function 
critically, I, I do have some familiarity <laughs> with the game. And I think criticism uh, for writers, uh, so-called creative writers, is one part of the creative process. You, you uh, project, and then you look at what you project. You, you, you see whether it's working. You identify what, where it's going. It's a two-way process. But I prefer just to try to write my own stuff and leave the criticism to other people. <laughs> Now, what are you working on at the present time? Various I'm working, things? Yes, various things. I'm working on a, uh, a book of essays uh, and uh, literary subjects, American culture, uh, one essay on the American language and so on, um, some music, uh, essays on music and on certain figures in jazz. Then I have another small book that I'm putting together. And this will not be a collection of essays, I hope, but a little book on the aesthetics of jazz, I mean of the blues, mm -hmm. which will get into jazz. And I'm writing a novel. Now, how does this work as far as, uh, as, as far as your own patterns are concerned? Do you switch off from time to time on as which uh, one of these <laughs> things you concentrate on? Or uh, do you uh, give a... Uh, energies in a given period of time directed toward one thing? Well, I try to give most of my energies to the novel, but uh, uh, from time to time I'm called upon to do certain essays, um, and I write those essays, and they are, that represents a certain interruption of the fiction, but they will go into, an, uh, into the book of essays, and it's just, uh, you have to to uh, keep one section of your mind a little bit separate from the other, but also realize that it's much more important to write a piece of fiction than to write a piece of, of uh, criticism. That is for me. Why? Well, because uh, I can reach more people uh, by projecting uh, uh, actions and characters and telling a story. Uh, it has a way into to, to uh, more people than uh, dry intellectual analysis of uh, some particular aspect of culture, personality. Now, you indicated with the uh, writing of Invisible Man that you had to uh, then at one point pare down about 200 pages worth. <laughs> is this going to be a problem that you will face with the next novel, or is this just a difference in the time, or what? No, I think it's a problem I'll face with, with this novel, uh, not because I don't have a certain discipline, but because uh, the imagination sometimes takes off. Uh, it takes off just like, a, uh, uh, say, a jazz musician who is um, on a flight of improvisation. So I let, I let it go as, as where it wants to go, and then I pare it down. It's better to have it all down than to have missed an opportunity of writing yourself into something startling and, and interesting. And so it's just a matter then of having to take the... <laughs> That's right, and then cut, cut your heart out to cut out those words. <laughs> <laughs> and our guest has been Ralph Ellison, author of Invisible Man, and we will look forward to your next novel. Do you have a title for it yet? No title. We'll just have to wait for that. And thank you. Thank you. Sweetie. Gilbert Tavener is college chaplain at Simpson College in Indianola, Iowa. He spoke before the Iowa Sponsors of Future Teachers of America at the Iowa State Education Association State Convention earlier this month. And you started out with the group by making some comment about the name of their group, the Iowa Sponsors of Future Teachers of America. Yes, I suggested that they would probably have to change the name not to future because that all pupils, all students these days, kindergarten through graduate school, are co-teachers. So that uh, the students sitting there may be teaching you.
because he has experiences you don't have. You will be teaching him. And so there are no future teachers. There are only present teachers. Now, is this part of what you are identifying as one of the characteristics of the new breed of students? Yes. Uh, students today, even young children, have such an opportunity to travel. They see television. They listen to radio. Multimedia is, is a part of our time. Therefore, the extension of the classroom, even quite formally, is going on where it did not go on previously. You left school, you went to do something else. Now you may watch a program. It may not be formally educational, but actually it is a, an extension of it. This adds not only dimensions of knowledge heretofore not known, but it means that uh, a, a student will see a program, for example, on television that a teacher has missed. He needs to express this. Then the co-teaching goes on. Now, I was just thinking in a sense that this can have some major importance in this uh, family relationship and perhaps some of the dying customs of the conversation around the dinner table because perhaps the youngsters are in the role that the adults were before in conveying the information. Precisely. You used to be able to go home and give a chemical formula that your parents didn't know, and this bugged them, as they love to say. But now, uh, there are so many areas of, of activity. A student recently told me he tried to discuss the moratorium around the table, and it was verboten, it was forbidden, because the parents were not interested in this particular area of education, which the student felt was an educational technique, and which uh, the parents felt was political activity not to be discussed. Now, are we going to see more of this uh, direct involvement of the student in the social issues and concern and expression of this concern? Well, yes, we're going, I think we're seeing more of it. It is not really new. Comenius in the 17th century said that the method of education he liked best was for teachers to teach less and learners to learn more. Well, actually, these centuries later, this is coming into its own. So I think we will see more of it and particularly with the multimedia, the mobility of uh, students. Uh, a tiny uh, first grader argued with his teacher about glacial action. He had thrown snowballs on the glacier, and the teacher had never been there. The first grader was correct, and the teacher was incorrect. Now, this is an isolated example, but it goes on. Now, what does this mean as far as our present educational system? I think it means uh, breaking down the rigidities of structure. It means that uh, the totality of education, which I think is already going on, is included in the activity of the school board, so that it is understanding that once a classroom is completed, that the education experience is not completed. Uh, the extracurricular activities are integrated, uh, evening classes, classes for adults. The totality, this isn't simply children and youth learning, it is the total society being involved in this. Educational television, uh, team teaching, or the, the, it's just huge and, and growing and really quite spontaneous. This is going to make a major difference in the training of our uh, uh, teachers? Very much so, very much so. Are these uh, changes being made in our higher institutions? Uh, that's a very delicate question to ask somebody on a college faculty. Uh, sometimes we wonder if they're being made. I think that the teachers' colleges, if that's rather an anachronism, but the courses and teachers' colleges in general are trying definitely to accommodate to this. It is, uh, it is such an explosive thing, and the techniques are so expensive. Uh, the, the hardware, the equipment is there, but it's very expensive that it's hard to catch up with. I think perhaps uh, some of the most exciting teaching, teaching is going on in the high school level. This is not to uh, deplore college teaching. If you have two good teachers in college, no student has to learn, <laughs> you see. Whereas in high school, he needs to be perhaps motivated more than he does in, in college. And I've been quite thrilled with some of the team teaching, some of the work which has been going on, which has utilized multimedia. So that students, for example, can talk about films, Easy Rider or Midnight Cowboy or these kinds of things, and relate them in societal ways. And this, this is teaching, this is education, this is interaction. But with this sort of interaction on real meaningful things in the life of the young person, then perhaps uh, school will be meaningful enough that there is not the need to drop out on these number of years that we expect young people to stay into the educational system now. The 
prior generations did not have as part of their ex expectations. Right. In fact, uh, instead of dropping out, they're probably in the, uh, get out the crystal ball here, mm -hmm. there will probably be a great many more opportunities to vary your education so that you may do traveling in connection with, say, high school work, or as well as college work, where small children will be encouraged to go not simply to museums, but to, be, to go to businesses and to see this kind of thing. And the interaction with society will go on, so students will not feel the need to be dropping out to do something. They will be dropping in, and the flexibility of the program and the creativity of the program Will, will be conducive. This is a prediction which I'm hoping will come true. I'm hoping it's true now in many places, and it is. How can the general public, the, the regular citizen, assist in adding the, well, shall we say, curriculums and facilities so that uh, the educational system can carry out some of the things that have to be done in response to the student? Right. I think that one of the things is that the um, education needs to involve the general citizen in terms of uh, his activity. When you get somebody who is going to an evening class, this person understands more about the school property and everything else. I think that uh, a, a program of communication uh, across the lines as to what the changing modes of education are how, uh, how education has changed, uh, the, the, all the things that are going on in the convention of the Iowa State Teachers Association, these things need to be communicated as you're trying to do to a general public. Then the public will see that these are not frills, that these are, some, these are any kinds of using a, a television in school is not a frill. Having a film or whatever the case may be is, is not an extracurricular activity. Mm -hmm. It's an integrated part then they will, in, they will be willing to see this in its proper perspective. And most people are, once they have the opportunity to see this and experience it. The general public is not opposed to education by any means. And uh, sometimes misinterpretation of the forms. Very much so. And uh, 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 students, whether they be in grammar school, high school, or college, often lead in this misinterpretation by not always understanding themselves that uh, something has meaning beyond their own participation in it. School boards uh, and school committees, boards of trustees, boards of regents, need very much to be involved in the total educational process. So uh, school committees could well go back to school, you see? Go back to school for a while and, and really understand what's going on. Boards of regents could do this exciting. And we've been doing some of this and enjoying it immensely, and so do the people involved. It's, well, it's great. It's always uh, been a, a sort of a an old adage, I think, that if somebody's complaining a lot, put them on the committee that's working on it, so <laughs> yes. then they'll know what problems you're dealing with. Yes. Particularly if it's a committee that will help him participate and interact in the problems. Uh, and and this, is a, this doesn't always work, but it can work. I wish we had time to pursue some of your thoughts about the, well, let's say the morality of the students, because being chaplain, I suspect you have some comments to make about this, but that would take an entire yes. new interview. May I put one statement yes. in, risky that it is for such a brief time? I am very much impressed with the standards of morality of our students in general, and uh, I think that they are not always understood. There are changing forms, but I think there are people of high integrity, and I think they have deep sense of right and wrong. Thank you. Gilbert Tavener is college chaplain at Simpson College in Indianola, Iowa, and thank you very, very much. Elizabeth Shaw is a Republican from uh, Davenport. This is your third term exactly. in the uh, House. And um, how does it differ from the term before? 
Well, I would say it certainly becomes more exciting because one becomes more part of the operation of the legislature and more knowledgeable about how to proceed and, and has more voice in the decisions, and that makes it more fun. Okay, now before we get into the background part, what legislative committees are you uh, uh, on this year? I'm chairman of the House Committee on Constitutional Amendments and Reapportionment. Now, you would not have been able to have had that chairmanship as a as Oh, a certainly not. First Freshmen day. are never committee chairmen. Uh -huh. uh, occasionally, second-term members are committee chairmen, but more often not. I, I have served as the ranking member of that committee for both of my preceding terms. Now, is this like vice chairman in a sense? Mm -hmm. Exactly, like mm -hmm. vice chairman. Uh, I also serve on the Judiciary Committee on the Schools Committee. Now, going back to some of your, your background, as I said, I don't want a campaign speech, but tell us a few of your qualifications, because my impression is that the women are very well qualified that become members of the legislature. Well, women who choose to run, at least, uh, certainly have some kind of a background in government. I think they have to be motivated to do it uh, by work they've done or other offices <laughs> they've held, community activities in which they've engaged. I did study political science in college. It was a matter of some interest to me. I had relatives who were active in government, both in party organizations, and I had an uncle who served in the legislature many, many years ago. When I first met my husband, he asked me to marry him and go to law school with him <laughs> in the same breath. So uh, I said yes to both of the proposals, and I did graduate from law school as well and did practice law. And I, I think that uh, practice in the legal area is a good, is, is good training and background for the legislature. It's certainly not an essential, but it does cause people to think uh, a lot about the type of laws which are being passed. Now, it, it has the benefit of being able to, to uh, recognize the implications of legal uh, materials, and this is actually how laws are written in this language, isn't it? Yes, I think so, and it, it uh, leads people to make a closer scrutiny of the language of laws and so on. Many, many times bills are passed which do not read and therefore are not interpreted as they were intended to. What happens then when you recognize this before you get even out of that session of the legislature? Well, by and large, the law, well, it's possible to amend a bill before the end of the session, and this has been done. Uh, this is the happier instance of what happens. Sometimes it's not discovered until some time later that the language actually does not do what was intended, and then perhaps some hardship is wrought. Mm -hmm. Now, of the committee, uh, the committees that you uh, uh, participate in, uh, are there any that uh, perhaps have priority in your mind? Well, of course I would have the to put the, the committee of which I'm the chairman first. It is an area that I've long been interested in because of my political science background and also work uh, as a member of the League of Women Voters who take a good deal of interest in keeping the Constitution current, and also in reapportionment matters. That was a group which was one of the earliest proponents of redistricting of the state legislature and of fair districting of Congress. And uh, their premises have been proved true by Supreme Court decisions, and we really have come a long way and will complete the work now as we redistrict on the 1970 census. The redistricting that was done in the legislature last time was on the one man, one vote principle, but it was on the basis of the 1960 census. So we're about to enter the final step, and then, of course, because of the census here, we're also redistricting our congressional districts, and that is a tremendous challenge. Now, who does this? Does the state legislature yes. do this, too? Yes. Now, what will be the big issues in this? Well, the biggest issue is that we now have seven congressmen, no. and we'll only have six, uh, so it means we're we're redistricting somebody out of a district, and uh, that's, that's the, the very great problem. What are the major uh, reasons for the various fights? I mean, we know we have to get rid of one. Well, it's an, on basis of total population, and that there are only a certain number of representatives in Congress. Mm -hmm. As population grows, and other states grow more rapidly than Iowa, then we, we lose a congressman. Well, I was meaning within the state, though, as to where the lines are drawn. What are the main issues and fights as to where you draw these lines and which, which districts somebody well, is in? Well, of course, uh, the 
first consideration is where existing congressmen dwell. This is not a persuasive consideration, but it's one of considerable interest to the incumbents. Mm -hmm. We have a constitutional provision that prohibits the crossing of county lines in congressional districting, and yet at the same time, the Supreme Court has said that that's not a valid reason to draw a district which isn't equal. Mm -hmm. So we will, first of all, have to make some kind of an assumption uh, as to whether the Iowa constitutional provision governs or, or whether the Supreme Court mandate governs or, or whether perhaps they aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, whether we can continue to have one man, one vote or, or in essence virtually equally equal districts and still observe our county lines. Mm -hmm. And we're really in the process right now of analyzing some computer runs and, and trying to make some plans of our own and, and doing a, a study job on it rather than doing anything in an actual way. Now, of course, money isn't going to be a very, very important factor affecting all legislation, I would assume. Yes, it is. And my um, second most important committee, I would say, is appropriations. I omitted <laughs> to mention it when you asked me earlier, but uh, I consider that, uh, apart from being a chairman of a committee, I consider the appropriations committee the um, most challenging, and it's also the most demanding of, of a legislator's time, but I think it does give one the opportunity to make some of the final determinations in where the money goes and how it's spent, which determines how the government functions. Now, are you also on the Education Committee? I can't remember. Schools. It's schools. divided yeah. be between higher education and schools, and I'm on schools. Now, between appropriations and schools, are you going to have any conflicts of getting the, the wants on the one hand and financing them on the other? Well, uh, that, that's always true because we keep having greater demands for state money, but not any more from the educational sector than from all of the others, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, a good deal of our state money does go to education, but a good deal of it goes to building roads and many other things. Now, at this particular stage of the legislature, what sort of work takes up most of your time? In this early part mm -hmm. of the session, right. I, I think the committee work is of the utmost importance early in the session. Some states actually only meet in session two or three days a week in the early part of their session. The remainder of the time is allocated to committee meetings. We determined that we would stay in session for five days a week, but that our sessions would be shorter on each day. And, and the work is being done on the bills in committee, and until they're considered by subcommittees and reported out, there's not as much work to be done in general session. Now, how can the constituent affect your uh, attitude or their particular legislator's uh, attitude best? And at what point? Well, any legislator, in my view, who is worth his salt observes as much as he can the wishes of his constituents. Uh, I, I think any legislature must equate that with things he knows, perhaps, which the individual who writes about some particular issue, which is paramount in his mind, does not know. This is a perennial question, and there's not any easy answer. It's one that legislators struggle with continually, when, particularly when a constituent wishes you to proceed in some fashion that you've determined isn't in the general interest, and yet you must mollify your constituent. Often it's not possible to change his mind because he has one thing in his mind, and it's his primary consideration, and he's not disposed to consider the general welfare. He wants his consideration to come first. And we thank Elizabeth Shaw, Republican from Davenport, and we have to realize her position of uh, representing the poor, the rich, the educated, the uneducated, the young, and the old. And thank you very much.